Just so I know, Sabrina, am I going to see when other uh, participants log in? Yeah, Alex, if you go to, if you look down at the bottom where you see participants, it says 51. Oh, wow. That was fast. Yeah, we're I... only seeing the, uh, the um, panelists, but everyone's on. Okay, well, um, without further ado, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're so excited that you registered and have logged on to the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society webinar series. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about tumor basics. So we have uh, five fantastic female orthopedic oncologists that are going to be uh, joining and presenting for the session. And um, we're hopeful to inspire, inspire you that tumor is awesome, um, that we can do uh, really incredible uh, surgeries and, and it really engage in, in meaningful patient care. So I'm going to uh, open the uh, session. My name is Alex Callen. I'm an orthopedic oncologist at UT Southwestern in Dallas. And I, I really just want to kick off the session uh, with a quote and an incredible drawing uh, that was uh, completed by Yuri Hahn. Um, and the quote I found was uh, from Dolly Parton. If your actions create a legacy that inspires others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more, then you are an excellent leader. Uh, and so uh, with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Uh, th that's me uh, with a, a little bit younger and a, a little bit cooler hairstyle, but uh, I'm uh, the chief of orthopedic oncology at UT Southwestern, which includes covering Parkland, our county hospital, children's health, and Texas Scottish Rite. I complete my residency at Vanderbilt and then fellowship at MD Anderson. Uh, and things that I'm really invested in right now in my career are the Children's Oncology Group and uh, resident medical, medical education and flipping the classroom. We'll open our talks with, oh, sorry, Cara Cipriano uh, is the moderator and amazingly coordinated her schedule despite travel constraints and, and things. Uh, to help guide our questions at the end. Uh, but Kara was the one that actually organized this entire thing. So we're uh, incredibly grateful that she uh, wanted to promote a tumor session. And she's currently at the University of Pennsylvania as an associate professor and chief of orthopedic oncology. She completed her residency at Rush and did two fellowships uh, in both adult reconstruction, that's joint replacements at VCU and then orthopedic oncology at University of Toronto. And uh, while she was, her, her first job was at uh, St. Louis, where she got uh, a master's of science and is really passionate about undergraduate medical education. And she's the mother of three daughters, including a dog, a cat, and a child. Uh, opening the talks today, we'll have Erica Giles. She's an assistant professor at UT Health in Houston. Uh, she completed her residency at Wash U in St. Louis also complete the MD Anderson Orthopedic Oncology Fellowship. And amazingly, she did this all as a Canadian. So uh, she uh, can address any questions about jumping uh, the border. Uh, following that, we'll have uh, Nina Christina Gatowski uh, talk uh, about metastatic bone disease. She's an assistant professor at Cooper University Healthcare. She complete her residency at Thomas Jefferson University and then her orthopedic oncology fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And she is actually coming to us live at the very end of her maternity leave as she's the mother of two boys under two years old. Uh, the youngest, uh, two months was, uh, was ambitious, just uh, is about 10 weeks old right now. Following uh, Nina, we'll have uh, Alyssa, uh, Alyssa Kemp, who's an assistant professor at Wayne State Cancer Center. She completed a residency at Baylor College of Medicine and stayed on for the fellowship at MD Anderson. Uh, she has uh, a lot of interest in diversity in orthopedics and is very active as a board member of the Gladden Society and Nth Dimensions. She is my social media mentor. I've yet to live up to uh, Alyssa's uh, prolific uh, posting. Um, and she has two young kids. 
And with that, I'll leave us with uh, the outline. Uh, we'll, uh, again, talk about primary bone tumors, soft tissue sarcomas, metastatic bone disease, and then creative sur surgical solutions. And then we'll leave it open um, uh, for questions at the end. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Everyone is currently on mute. Uh, there's a lot of people on this webinar. And so uh, we would ask that you put questions in the group chat. If there are science questions or medically related questions about the presentation, we'll try to just answer those directly in the chat. But if you have questions about um, being a female surgeon, being an orthopedic oncologist, work-life balance, or any questions that may come up uh, in your personal journey, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll moderate those for the last 10 to 15 minutes of the session. So with that, we'll kick it off with uh, Dr. Giles talking about metastatic bone disease. Or, sorry, she, she's going to talk actually about primary bone tumors. Thanks, Alex. All right, let me uh, make sure I share this properly. Y'all can see my screen. Cool. All right. All right. I'm uh, I'm Erica Giles. I'm coming to you fresh out of the OR here in Houston. So, and I'm talking to you about primary uh, primary bone tumor. So back to the basics. Um, what is cancer? Right. So cancer has six hallmarks. These are the the hallmark of it really is just uncontrolled and inappropriate cell division, and it has all of these hallmarks of these. Uh, where these cells basically acquire um, this autonomous and proliferative drive. Um, they have sustained angiogenesis, they hide from the immune system, and they basically are able to escape uh, cell cycles that tell them that they should die and enter the reproduction cycle inappropriately, um, by which they accumulate these chromosomal uh, aberrity, uh, aberrations. Um, Talking about primary bone tumors, looking at the origin of these malignancies, sarcomas are um, uh, derived from mesoderm, so sort of mesenchymal origin. So when we say a primary bone tumor or sarcoma, that's the cell of origin that we're talking about. So primary tumors of bone are malignant mesenchymal tumors that um, or originate in the bone. Um, they're rare. They represent only 0.2 to 0.5% of all malignancies, but they can represent up to 5% of all childhood malignancies. So it's important to remember when you see an abnormal lesion in the bone of a person under the age 40, there's a higher uh, likelihood that it is a primary bone tumor. Um, the incidence is still relatively rare. When you look at all bone lesions, uh, benign bone lesions are exceedingly common, right? So up to 30% of people will have one of these non-ossifying fibromas in childhood, probably more than that, that we just don't identify. Um, but it is important to keep in mind when you see these lesions that, especially in patients under the age of 40, that while these malignant bone tumors are rare, they are relatively more common in both pediatric age groups and in patients under 40. And so that actually changes what we do when we see um, aggressive lesions on x-ray when, uh, when they're identified. So the NCCN has great guidelines. I love referring to this for a lot of stuff, especially since I'm pretty early in practice. Um, but they have uh, actually these algorithms for when you uh, uh, an abnormal lesion of bone is identified on x-ray. One of the first uh, forks in the road is what is the age of the patient, and that guides your workup entirely. So not everybody gets everything. Not everybody gets a biopsy of a bone lesion. Really, it's driven by the age of the patient, what it looks like on x-ray, and that helps you drive your differential on what you're going to do next. Not everything you see is a sarcoma, but you do have to maintain a level of suspicion. Talking about radiographic features of primary bone tumors, these are all aggressive features on imaging. And so if you have a lesion that's non-aggressive or benign, been there for a while, it'll actually form a sclerotic rim of bone around itself. Um, that, that, that tells you that it's not changing, it's not growing, it's not bursting through the bone generally. Whereas these, these are all reactions of bone to something that's very aggressive and growing and changing. And so you develop this onion skinning, which is actually a layering of the periosteum as this tumor bursts through the cortex. Um, the next thing you see here is sunburst pattern. 
This is ossification of Sharpley's fibers that attach the periosteum to the bone. Um, and this, this lesion is acting so aggressively, it's actually lifting the periosteum and then these fibers ossify along there. Um, the Codman's triangle is sort of a combination of both, but uh, suffice to say these, when you see these changes in bone, these are hallmarks of aggressive bone lesions that are sarcomental proven otherwise essentially. Um, advanced imaging. So after you get an x-ray of the whole bone, the next thing you're going to do is get an MRI with and without contrast. And you can see these skip lesions, which are essentially metastatic disease within the same bone. And you can also see this soft tissue extension, which again is uh, represented on those uh, aggressive changes on radiograph. Classifications of uh, malignant bone tumors. We could talk about this for hours, uh, <laughs> for weeks, actually. Um, this is the uh, WHO classification, essentially, uh, but really today we're going to talk about a basic overview of the three most interesting ones that we all get really excited about when we see, um, and they also happen to be the most common. Uh, so osteosarcoma, we think of as a disease of pediatric and adulthood. E-wing sarcoma, we think of as a disease of, pe of uh, pediatrics, and cottage sarcoma, we think of as nearly exclusively a disease of adulthood. So a thousand foot view, osteosarcoma, it's a tumor of mesenchymal origin, right? This is all that we're talking about here. Uh, it produces osteoder immature bone. Uh, it's thought to arise from these pluripotent mesenchymal stem cells, but you know. Um, epidemiology, it's got this bimodal distribution. So you see most of it in like a, a peak of the, the first or second decade. And those are mostly primary osteosarcomas. And then you get this peak as people get older. And those are uh, representative of a secondary osteosarcoma. Um, and those are usually uh, a degeneration of Paget's disease. And you only see that in older people. So it's pretty easy to remember. Um, there's a just like everything, we love dividing things into categories. So there's a million different ways to think about this and divide them up. Um, what does it look like on radiograph? It looks aggressive, right? It looks like it's bursting through bone. It's bone forming. So it has a lot of sclerosis. We describe it as ivory or ivory clouds. And then again, you get the sunburst pattern. And you also typically get a Codman's triangle. But this can really be, if it's a very aggressive disease, it can be surprisingly lytic actually. Um, prognosis, unsurprisingly, if you present with metastatic disease, um, you have a fairly low uh, five-year survival, although mm -hmm. really it's not survival, it's not uh, surgery that's changed the game here. It's really the chemotherapy. In the 1980s, when Terry Fox was around, um, the, the survival from this was really flipped. So the, the if you presented with um, osteosarcoma, there I think the survival over five years was something like 20%. Um, and now for a conventional osteosarcoma, the survival at five years is something like 70 or 80%. Um, the standard treatment nowadays is chemotherapy followed by surgeon, surgery followed by uh, another round of chemotherapy. Um, this improves survival. If you only get surgery on your osteosarcoma, you have a under 20% uh, percent, um, will achieve four years of event-free survival. When you combine those, uh, talking about all-comer osteosarcoma, again, it's a 70% uh, event-free survival rate. Prognostic factors, obviously metastatic disease, uh, disease in the pelvis or, ab or um, the um, axial skeleton, uh, and more aggressive disease or higher grade is a poor prognostic factor. And then actually the response to chemotherapy is an important prognostic factor too. So when you take these out after chemotherapy and you look at them under the microscope, if you have over 90% necrosis in your specimen, that's actually a good prognostic factor for that patient. It means that they've responded to their treatment. On to chondrosarcoma really briefly. Again, a tumor of mesenchymal origin, except this produces cartilage matrix. Um, there's really a spectrum, spectrum of cartilage tumors as a way to think about it, and it's always going to be a disease of adulthood, um, almost exclusively. Um, never say never, but, you know, sometimes they always. Um, there's a peak in the third to seventh decade. Um, again, we love dividing it into subtypes. Uh, there, I think of about these as like there's a spectrum of uh, chondrosarcomas, and then there's these kind of weird little outliers, the mesenchymal, the clear cell, and the conventional. Um, 
the cartilage tumor spectrum here, you have your benign enchondromas that we've heard about, these little nests of cartilage within the bone. And then as you get further down the more bizarre spectrum, you start to get into these uh, well-differentiated or the low-grade or grade one chondrosarcomas, followed by grade two, grade three, and then your really aggressive ones, which get to be these de-differentiated high-grade or your mesenchymal um, is also high-grade. So again, this is what the low grade or the, the well-differentiated uh, chondrosarcoma looks like, very much like cartilage, except a little bit more bizarre. When you get into the grade two, it looks a little bit more mixoid. And grade three tends to look pretty bizarre. You've got these um, hyperchromatic chromatin and really just different sizes of cells, too many cells within cartilage. Um, Oh, I didn't, and I didn't include the mesenchymal and the de-differentiated, de but essentially those are our, our cartilage tumors next to a high-grade sarcoma or a small round blue cell, um, which really changes the treatment on those. They're pretty interesting. So chondrosarcoma in general, uh, it's a surgical disease. Uh, so it's a lot of fun for us. Um, but there are a few situations to understand what your adjuvants can do. So radiation can be used uh, in some high grade disease or in high risk lesions, or if you have a positive margin. Um, mesenchymal subtype, uh, it's one of these cartilage uh, tumors that is right next to a small round blue cell component, almost like an Ewing sarcoma. And so those actually get Ewing's chemotherapy followed by surgery. And then the de-differentiated subtype, that's a high-grade spindle sarcoma next to a lower-grade cartilage component. And so those actually undergo a more like an osteosarcoma protocol to deal with the, the high-grade spindle cell, and then they get surgery. So those are kind of important ones to remember for referral. All right, thousand-foot view of Ewing's. I know I'm talking really fast. So um, these are, uh, this is a desmoplastic small round blue cell tumor, and Ewing sarcoma is more than just Ewing's. When we say Ewing's, it's actually part of a family of these small round blue cell tumors. It includes Ewing's, it includes these things called peanuts, um, Askin's tumor, it may include small cell uh, osteosarcoma, there's still a lot of de different, uh, differentiation going on. Um, but it is a hallmark translocation of this uh, EWSR1 fly1. Um, there's been other translocations described, and actually it's the ES, ES, EWSR1 fly1 has the best prognosis of all those translocations. Um, but this is the hallmark. This is what was uh, what this was described off of. Again, the age distribution, we think of these more as a disease, especially Ewing's, uh, more of the disease of childhood. Um, small round blue cell tumors can happen later, but it's usually a disease of childhood. Um, it is important to note that this is much more common. It's very rare, actually, to have uh, an Ewing sarcoma in, uh, in Black children. Uh, it's much more common in white or Hispanic children. Um, this is what the radiographs look like. So you, uh, if you have a lytic lesion of a flat bone in a child, have a high degree of suspicion. And then these actually have this really uh, permeative features. So you get this, um, this onion skinning, but then you'll get this really large soft tissue mass associated with it. Sorry, what's my time here? Um, treatment for Ewing sarcoma. Uh, Three is... more minutes, Erica. You're doing Thank great. You. Thanks, Alex. Um, this is going to be chemotherapy followed by surgery or radiation followed by more chemotherapy in general. Um, it's known that uh, surgery is going to improve local control over radiation. Um, nowadays, radiation is generally reserved for uh, if you have positive margins or for palliation or metastatic disease, uh, or if it's an unresectable tumor. Um, otherwise, these generally undergo surgery at most modern centers. We do know that uh, surgery followed by radiation only uh, will have a 10, um, uh, you have a fairly high chance of recurrence within four years. Radiation is also not a free lunch. It carries a risk of transformation into higher grade sarcomas down the line. Um, so generally these will undergo surgery. Multimodal therapy, you've got a 65% chance of a four year event free survival. Again, prognostic factors age older than 15. If you've got metastatic disease, uh, there is a translocation association with prognosis. Um, 
you it I, if you have a poor response to therapy so again if you take these out and there's under an 85 percent necrosis in the specimen that's a poor prognostic factor um and then tumor size so bigger badder things do worse essentially and that's the same for everything we do um i know that alex is going to talk about surgery principles later i love taking these out but um Here's a little summary. Primary bone tumors, they're really diverse. It's a group of malignant uh, tumors that are all tied together by their cell of origin, with, which is mesenchyme from the mesoderm. Mm -hmm. Osteosarcoma is a disease of, disease of pediatric and adulthood. These undergo chemotherapy, followed by surgery by more through chemotherapy. Chondrosarcoma, it's a disease of adulthood, and these are generally um, undergo just surgery, but there are exceptions to that rule. Ewing sarcoma, you can think of as a disease of generally pediatric age group. Uh, these undergo chemotherapy followed by surgery, but followed by chemo. Any bone lesions, especially in people under age 40 and in pediatrics with those aggressive features, especially the cortex and the periosteum require a really high degree of suspicion and an early referral to uh, an orthopedic oncologist. Um, so it's really the x-ray um, and the age group that defines your next step in staging, uh, defines the imaging that you get and whether or not they enter a goal of biopsy. Um, surgical management in primary bone tumors is critical and creative and a lot of fun. And I think I'm right at 15 minutes, so. You were perfectly on time. Thank Thanks you. so much, Erica, for sharing a lot of the science and the uh, understanding of cancer. I, I think that's something that it's hard to wrap your head around. Um, and so building upon that, uh, we're going to switch over to Nina Gatowski uh, for her to uh, educate us more on metastatic bone disease. And Nina, just so you have the timeline, um, we'll have you go until 740. Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right. Does this look good to you guys? Looks All right. good. All right. So it's a pleasure to be here, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, here's a little roadmap for my talk. As much as everyone loves talking about treatment and I love showing great post-op x-rays, I realize that not many of you are ultimately going to go into oncology, but will 100% be faced with metastatic disease in your practice, no matter what subspecialty you uh, choose. Um, so it's important for you to really have kind of an intellectual framework for thinking about metastatic bone disease um, and providing you with that kind of foundation for that framework will be my goal tonight. So metastatic bone disease is also called skeletal metastases, and it refers to the situation where metastatic carcinoma, which first began in a soft organ of the body, has metastasized or spread to the skeleton. So as Dr. Giles kind of hinted at in our last lecture, this is conceptually very different than a primary bone sarcoma, which arises in the bone as its primary site. So based on this distinction, the treatments for a skeletal metastasis are very different than the treatment for a bone sarcoma. A patient with metastatic bone disease, by definition, has stage four metastatic blood-borne uncurable cancer, okay? Our surgeries cannot cure them, with cure meaning that every single last tumor cell is out of their body, all right? Our orthopedic surgery is not going to achieve that. So instead, we aim to control their pain and preserve their independent physical activity. Surgery for metastatic carcinoma involves nailing through a metastasis or plating around a metastasis. We are leaving tumor cells behind, but that's okay because the patient has blood-borne tumor cells. Um, so if we leave some in their bone, it, it's no harm, no foul. Bone sarcoma, on the other hand, is curable if you catch it early enough. And the surgeries we perf perform are for curative intent. Um, they therefore involve on-block resections of the tumor where every single last tumor cell is removed with negative margins. I kind of describe it to patients as like lifting a fly in an ice cube. Like we lift out the entire tumor out with negative margins around it. Okay, so the goals and the details of the surgeries are very different. And that's important to keep in mind when you're learning this stuff or else you get really confused. Like, why am I nailing this lesion but resecting this lesion? And it, it um, really comes down to this distinction. So there are five carcinomas that tend to spread to bone. These are the common culprits when we discuss 
sever a skeletal metastasis, that the carcinoma is originating in either the breast, lung, thyroid, kidney, or prostate. And once those carcinoma cells land from the bloodstream into the bone, they stimulate osteoblasts to release rank ligand. And that in turn activates osteoclasts to begin resorbing bone. So it's not the tumor cells chewing away the bone directly. It's the tumor cells kind of hijacking this uh, homeostasis uh, mechanism within our bone. And this is why bisphosphonates and denosumab are standard of care for any patient with a skeletal metastasis. And you must ask about that when you're doing a consult on these patients, because these drugs inhibit this pathway and thereby they prevent new lytic bone lesions. So what will this clinically present as? Patients will complain of pain. They'll either have a completed pathologic fracture or an impending pathologic fracture. Many will present with hypercalcemia or they can have neurologic compression if the metastasis is within their spine. When you obtain imaging, you'll see bony destruction and marrow replacement like this. And you have to approach this lesion with the differential diagnosis of metastatic bone disease, metastatic bone disease, metastatic bone disease, multiple myeloma, lymphoma, sarcoma, then all the benign stuff. Now, some patients may carry a known history of carcinoma in, their, in one of their organs, but many of them don't know that they have cancer at this point when they're sitting in an orthopedist's office with hip pain. So your next moves in terms of workup are all based on this differential. And because by far the most common explanation for a bone lesion like that in an older patient is metastatic carcinoma, many of the tests you'll order are focused on trying to locate the primary site of their cancer. Many of these tests don't even include the bone lesion in question. And we call this the hole in bone workup. It's kind of like a shotgun approach where you order all these things to look for the primary. The last step in the workup is a biopsy of the lesion. So a biopsy is necessary whenever you're making the diagnosis of metastatic bone disease for the first time. If the patient presents with known metastatic carcinoma to bone, you don't have to continue to biopsy every future lesion after that. It's safe to assume that what you're seeing is another site of their known disease. But if this is the first time that tumor cells have ever presented in their skeleton, you must prove that it is what you think it is by biopsying it. Once you've established the diagnosis of metastatic bone disease, you need to next consider the goals of care for treating the lesion and really for treating the whole patient. And they're palliative goals. You wanna relieve pain, you wanna prevent fractures, you wanna improve their physical function and allowing them to have as much time at home with their family as they can. Um, that'll improve the quality of their life for however long they have left. And you can actually, you know, prolong their survival by allowing them to stay mobile and keeping them out of bed. Um, and you want to achieve all of this, you know, in a cost conscious way. Often those goals can be achieved without surgery. Okay. So generally speaking for any skeletal lesion, your treatment options are observation, radiation, and surgical intervention. And it's important to really understand that there are two reasons why bones hurt when you have a metastatic lesion. Number one, the cortex where bone gets its strength is compromised and the bone is about to break. Or number two, there's just marrow packing of the tumor cells and the increased intraosseous pressure is what's driving the pain, but the bone is still strong. The former requires surgical stabilization. The latter responds very nicely to radiation alone. And it's your job to decide why that bone is hurting. It's almost like we need a crystal ball to see the future. You ask yourself, is this patient about to fracture unless I prophylactically fix them? Or is the bone strength not an issue and some palliative radiation is all they need? So the closest thing to a crystal ball that you've got is Morel's scoring system which you can apply to a lesion to decide whether or not it's at high enough risk of fracture that it's indicated for prophylactic fixation. So this system is based on four criteria, the site, the character of the pain, the lesion type, and the size. And you calculate the sum total score. If it's greater than eight, this is associated with an unacceptably high risk of pathologic fracture. And most of us would agree that prophylactic fixation would be recommended. If it's seven or below, fracture risk is in the single digits, and most of us would 
probably recommend palliative radiation and following the lesion. Remember though, each patient is so nuanced and they have their own circumstances that kind of come into play when you're making these decisions. So this scoring system should really just be the jumping off point. So when a patient is indicated for surgical treatment, you need to keep the following principles in mind. Uh, one bone, one operation is kind of one of the catchphrases where if you're exposing the patient to the risks of the operating room, you want to go in and try to stabilize as much of that bone as you can. You don't want to find that six months later, they developed another metastasis in that same bone, that bone in an area that you didn't cover. And now you have to take them back to surgery. Because pathologic bone is very unpredictable, untrustworthy in terms of healing, you want to be very liberal with your use of metal and cement, kind of along the lines of overfixing a diabetic ankle fracture, yeah. in that same philosophy. You want to try to excise the tumor if possible. You know, we're putting a plate around it or a nail through it. But if you can try to curette some of the tumor cells out, you may decrease their chance of local progression. Almost all patients uh, will undergo postoperative radiation. That's your responsibility to coordinate. You also need to talk to the medical oncologist to make sure that they're not on a drug that would preclude any type of surgical intervention. Solitary metastases have their own kind of school of thought that we can talk about. Sclerotic metastases can be extremely challenging to read through, drill through, nail through. And very importantly, you need to understand the patient's life expectancy. So that in involves talking to their medical oncologist because you do not want to do a surgery on them that is associated with you know a six to nine month recovery time and then they only live another four months because they, they spend the rest of their life recovering from your surgery. The recovery from your operation must be shorter than their expected life, uh, their life expectancy. And, but the construct you give them should outlast them. You do not want to be taking them back in a year for a revision because your construct has failed. So I'll just give you guys a couple examples that um, uh, highlight some of those principles. So here's a patient with um, weight-bearing left hip and thigh pain. And he, this patient obviously has an, uh, a large lytic subtrochanteric lesion in the left femur. Um, a very high risk of fracture here. If you were to calculate the Morel score, it would certainly be indicated for prophylactic fixation. But because this was the first presentation of any neoplastic disease, the patient underwent an open biopsy with frozen section, which you can see through that little cortical window on the lateral side of the proximal femur in those post-op x-rays. Frozen section showed evidence of metastatic carcinoma, so we felt comfortable moving forward with the prophylactic. Um, now this is an interesting example. So this is a woman with known metastatic breast cancer to bone. So the diagnosis is not in question, but I brought this up because I wanted to show you guys that the subtrochanteric lesion is very similar to the prior example, but I want to call your attention to the disease in the femoral neck and head. And that's an indication for arthroplasty over a cephalomedullary nail. So you could either go with a short or a long stem in general. There's some debate within our society about that, but um, in this case, the, that large diaphyseal metastasis, the large lesion in the shaft, was an indication to go with a long stem for this hemiarthroplasty. And all of these should be cemented. <laughs> this is another example of a patient with metastatic lung cancer. He had right tibial pain and left thigh pain. You can see that extremely large, destructive, expansile lesion in the proximal tibia that really leaves you no bone to try to stabilize or nail through or plate around. So we did a resection of that proximal tibia with endoprosthetic reconstruction. And then we prophylactically nailed his femur on the other side um, because he has that cortically based lytic lesion in the shaft with a very high risk of pathologic fracture. Now this case highlights a concept that I haven't brought up yet. And it's a case of oligometastatic renal cell carcinoma. So that word oligometastatic, the, the prefix oligo, as you guys probably know, means like very little, like, you know, um, oligohydramnios or oliguric, okay? Um, so we use that phrase to mean when a patient has only one or two skeletal sites of metastasis. So this patient had their primary kidney tumor and this proximal radius metastasis, that's it. 
So traditionally, we have always thought that once carcinoma is bloodborne, orthopedic surgery can't do anything to change the patient's survivability. I actually said that at the beginning of this talk. However, in oligometastatic renal cell carcinoma, studies have shown that resection of the metastasis can actually improve their life expectancy. So we performed an on-block resection of this proximal radius, along with the nephrectomy, you know, we resected his primary tumor, and this patient just hit his five-year mark being completely free of disease. So hopefully those four examples highlighted the concept that every patient is different, management can be very tricky, and people who just expect to kind of nail every case of metastatic disease are wildly underestimating the complexity and variability of it. It also takes a lot of communication and care coordination with the patient's oncology team. And if you don't have kind of the bandwidth in your practice to do that, it may be better to refer the patient to a tumor surgeon because we're happy to take care of all of that. We talk to these people all day, every day. That's kind of all we do. So um, I know it was only 15 minutes, but I hope you have a better understanding of what metastatic bone disease is, how to approach your workup of a bone lesion, how to decide between radiation versus surgery for impending fractures, and some of the principles that should guide your surgical planning. Thanks. Awesome, Nina. Uh, thanks so much for sharing. Uh, Nina's really been a great champion in um, uh, pushing for orthopedic oncologists to kind of own uh, these this population of patients in the United States as, as we get uh, an aging population and more and more patients living longer with cancer. Um, we, as a society, we really do think that it's meaningful to have the orthopedic oncologist involved in uh, the discussions and, and then really the management of these patients. Though that being said, to Nina's point, most of you on the call, no matter what specialty you go into, you're going to find a hole in a bone and have to do the workup and or find a friend to get them to the right place. So, um, awesome. Well, I don't see any questions yet. So either we're doing an amazing job or you guys are just so fascinated with orthopedic oncology. Um, uh, Dr. Kemp is detained, but is going to join us for the final session. So actually with the late start, I think the timing is going to work out perfectly that I will, um, switch to my presentation and, uh, spend the next 15 minutes, uh, going over some of the things that make our job kind of the most exciting. Sorry. As soon as I share, I lose the screen. All right, here we go. So, um, I uh, get the joy of sharing some of the creative solutions uh, that we have in limb salvage surgery. So in the next 15 minutes, uh, we're going to repeat bone sarcoma etiology and epidemiology. Repetition is the key to adult learning. We're going to go uh, over those treatment algorithms for bone sarcomas in kids. Uh, you're going to walk away with the five A's, understanding options for local control surgery. And, um, and then we'll go through a couple of uh, rehab challenges. So I do have a few disclosures, none relevant to the talk. Um, but you can't do a Ruth Jackson event without shouting out to some uh, uh, mentors. And so I, I've been really fortunate in my career to have really um, uh, phenomenal female mentors in orthopedic surgery. Not that I haven't had great... Um, uh, male mentors, because I, I've uh, learned a lot from uh, everyone through every step of my training from medical school all the way through fellowship and now even into practice seven years. Um, but I do want to give a, a shout out to Dr. Val Lewis, who uh, was certainly instrumental in many of the people here on the talk uh, in guiding us to be um, strong women and orthopedic oncologists. Uh, I'll give a shout out to my co-fellow, Nicole Montgomery, who's also a pediatric uh, orthopedist and orthopedic oncologist at Texas Children's. Uh, also, there's no way I would have gone into orthopedic oncology if it wasn't for my training at Vanderbilt. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to the mentorship of, of Dr. Ginger Holt there in the center and Dr. Jenny Halpern. Uh, both orthopedic oncologists at Vandy, and I had to throw in Dr. Herb Schwartz, um, who uh, who has certainly been a, a huge uh, supporter and advocate for my career. Um, and so, with that, uh, we'll we'll re go through uh, some of the uh, understanding of sarcomas 
So I always like to give little teaching lessons and make you understand the Greek origin. Sarcomas come from the Greek word sarx, uh, which is flesh. And uh, these are truly fleshy tumors. You, you have to understand what the difference between a tumor looks like grossly and what normal bone looks like. And so as Erica uh, taught us in the first session, this is a cancer that comes from a, a mesenchymal cell line. So um, in this talk, we're gonna specifically be talking about those bone cells, but it can come from cartilage, it can come from muscle, it can come from fat, it can come from nerves, and it can come from blood vessels. So we're gonna skip over the soft tissue sarcoma section, um, but ultimately those soft tissue sarcomas can come out of those soft tissues, muscles, fat, nerves, blood vessels. Um, as we know, these are incredibly rare. Uh, the latest NCI data shows there's only 3,200 new bone malignancies each year. Um, most of those are chondrosarcomas, but about 1,000 new osteosarcomas and about 300 new Ewing sarcomas each year. Uh, and most of those are in kids. So uh, just uh, again, to review aggressive features, uh, if you ever see Osteoid matrix, bone that is too bright white. If you see onion skinning, if you see extra osseous bone, that sunburst pad pattern or Codman's triangle, you got to make sure to get uh, uh, the appropriate workup, get them to an orthopedic oncologist. Um, in general, the treatment algorithm is chemo surgery, chemo for our bone sarcomas. And uh, so with that, uh, we'll talk about surgery. I, I do a presentation almost just like this for my patients, actually. I remind them that um, as they're going through a really traumatic time in their life with their child with a new cancer diagnosis, that uh, my job is to remove all of the cancer cells, especially in localized disease. I'm not going to compromise the oncologic outcome uh, for the functional uh, recovery. And so I remind them that every uh, discussion we have, my first goal is that I have to remove all of the cancer cells with an oncologic margin, meaning normal tissue outside of the cancer. And then certainly the next goal, uh, which they end up fixating more on, is to provide the best reconstruction possible. Um, this can be really complicated, and it, especially with proximity to blood vessels and nerves and joints and muscles. And then many of these kids are still growing. And so uh, with that, I always bring up the five A's. Um, it's important to uh, address the elephant in the room. There are still people that come in today, even kids the day I'm taking them to surgery that make me promise them I'm not gonna amputate their leg. So the first A I always bring up is amputation. And that does include rotation plasty. Um, we can reconstruct with allograft, that's cadaver bone. We can reconstruct with heavy metal, that's arthroplasty or joint replacement. We can combine those two techniques, allograft, cadaver bone, and prosthetic, a joint replacement. And then um, uh, the thing that's really uh, unique that we can do, especially in young kids, is use autograft. So uh, just so you have a brief understanding of what each of these are. Amputation, the level is dictated by the tumor. Um, there are certainly proponents in this picture. You see a, a little girl, she's a six-year-old that actually didn't have a cancer, but had really terrible Gorham stout disease that must have sustained 50 plus fractures to her femur. And so she got a rotation plasty where we take the lower leg, the tibia, turn that 180 degrees and then turn the um, heel into a knee joint that really improves prosthetic wear um, as long as you can get over the um, mental uh, appearance of having your leg flipped around 180 degrees. When you bring this up, patients either love it or they're appalled by it. And so uh, we have options aside from the amputation. As we get to allograft, you can see here, uh, sorry, there are gonna be graphic photos. This is a proximal tibia osteoarticular allograft. You can see this child was uh, seven when I did his surgery and the mismatch, I got the smallest, uh, youngest tibia I could find, uh, but still I was able to intersuscept the bone into the allograft. That's fixed with plates and screws and reconstruction of all the ligaments. Joint replacement. 
many of you are going to become joint replacement surgeons. These are primary joint replacements, but if you can replace a simple joint, uh, well, you can replace an entire bone. So we usually call these a mega endoprosthesis or uh, a mega joint replacement, a gigantic joint replacement. And you can see here um, that we can uh, replace every joint with metal. That does lead to some rehab uh, complications, uh, but certainly it's a great long lasting option for many of these kids. You can combine the two options. Uh, this is an APC of a proximal humerus. Uh, you can see, you can get allograft bone, you can get cadaver bone with tendon attached to it. So this is a really nice option in the shoulder where you can reconstruct the rotator cuff attaching uh, the native rotator cuff to the cadaver rotator cuff, and then putting a joint replacement in between. You can see two years later, uh, this was a 16-year-old girl. Uh, you almost can't see the junction. So um, if you ask me my favorite part of my job, it, it is my pediatric population, and it's the ability to be uh, creative and think outside of the box in order to give them the best reconstruction possible. Um, and that can be really challenging when kids are young um, and skeletally immature. So um, some of the options that we uh, use to preserve or um, match growth in the kids is uh, you can try to save the physis. Sometimes tumors are amenable to an intercalary allograft. Um, sometimes it makes sense to cut down, uh, shut down or do an epiphysiodesis on the contralateral limb. Um, autograft, I'm going to show you an example. We can get that bone to grow with the child. Um, then we have all of these new technologies that allow for intramedullary um, or uh, endoprosthetic growing devices. So my first example um, is an autograft example. So this is a three-year-old female with left shoulder pain. You can see the permeative, aggressive appearing bone lesion in the proximal humerus with a large uh, soft tissue component. This was biopsied and consistent with Ewing sarcoma. And so we put her down the algorithm, chemo, surgery, and chemo. And uh, we did a transficial vascularized fibula. So you can see here's the humeral re uh, resection on the uh, far left. This is her fibula resected with an intact growth plate um, and uh, then uh, transferred into the arm, uh, secured with a single quad cortical screw with a wimpy uh, rotator cuff reconstruction to biceps femoris. And um, uh, in preserving the blood flow to the, uh, the physis, she has now been able to grow her arm symmetric to the contralateral side. So you see over time, um, the uh, humerus heals to the fibula. It almost becomes uh, indistinguishable and it continues to grow. She's now three years out disease-free survival um, uh, and, and playing soccer and doing gymnastics. Um, so uh, exciting for her. Uh, my next kid is a six-year-old that had right knee pain. He got diagnosed with an osteosarcoma. Um, you can see that uh, it was a pretty small osteosarcoma. There wasn't a huge extramedullary component. Um, and I realized I only needed nine centimeters for oncologic margins. So as I start to think about options for him, I give them the family talk. I say, okay, you can get an amputation. We could do an above knee uh, amputation or rotation plasty. Um, we could consider an allograft with an intramedullary growing device. We could do a growing endoprosthesis, uh, or we could uh, do an allograft APC. He may still have 10 years of growth remaining and nine centimeters to achieve. So I ended up doing an osteoarticular allograft with a precise uh, magnetic growing nail. Uh, you can see, again, there's a huge mismatch. This was the smallest femur I could find. And again, I intussuscept the bone into um, the allograft. I reconstruct all of the tendons, ACL, PCL, MCL, LCL. I preserve his extensor mechanism. Uh, and then we wait. Finally, he finishes chemo. He heals his allograft junction. And I take him back for his first lengthening. So I do a subtrochanteric osteotomy send the patient home with an intramedullary, uh, uh, with a magnet to grow his nail. 
And you can see that he's now four years out from his index procedure. I've done two lengthening procedures, but I've been able to uh, maintain symmetric growth. Yes, he has a very valgus neck um, and uh, he's probably gonna need one more lengthening because he's only 10, but he's playing soccer and jumping on trampolines. Um, my next is a 10 year old female with a pathologic fracture uh, while doing ballet. You can see right away, this is a bad sign. She has skip metastases that um, are not only at the primary site where she fractured, but up in the proximal femur. And so, um, but this was her only site of disease. So this is stage three, no distant disease aside from the femur. And so we go to the drawing board with the, uh, the engineers and designed her a total femur replacement. This is a magnetic expandable endoprosthesis. The magnet gearbox lives down near um, the distal femur, and then uh, there's an intramedullary screw or an intradevice screw that will expand utilizing, sorry, let me get to a magnet. Um, and uh, it's a, a really amazing way to help maintain length as these kids grow. So uh, this is about a 50 or 60 pound magnet that you put the patient's leg in to um, expand that screw. Uh, in a 20 minute procedure, you can get five millimeters of length. And you can see that over time, uh, here's index leg length, uh, before any lengthening. And then over time, I'm able to expand this implant. Um, unfortunately, this child did uh, die of disease two and a half years after her diagnosis. You can see even on this far uh, right x-ray, there's some uh, bone mets and she developed really profound uh, face, uh, facial mets to her mandible and to her lungs. All right. Woo. I'm glad Alyssa didn't come on earlier. Welcome to the talk, Alyssa. Um, I, I, I'm going to close out with two more cases. Here's a 10-year-old female with a Ewing sarcoma in the right in the left superior pubic rami. Uh, she actually responded really nicely to chemotherapy. The soft tissue component almost disappeared, uh, but we still need to do a reconstruction. I wanted to try to preserve her hip. So I uh, decided I could rebuild her hip socket with her own bone. Um, so I wanted to do an autograft reconstruction. And I did this with the assistance of Onco's custom cutting guides to rebuild um, the uh, anterior aspect of, of the uh, acetabulum. And so uh, here are some of the custom models. We got a negative margin resection and uh, Sooner than I would have liked, she's now two years disease-free survival, back riding horses, pain-free, uh, with an intact uh, 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 hip joint. I'm going to close it out with one last unique case. This is a six-year-old female uh, with lee Fraumani syndrome. Uh, by six, this is already her second malignancy. And um, you can see pre-chemo is here on the left. Post chemo, she's really responded nicely and ossified. Um, really tried to push for that autograft reconstruction with the fibula, um, but family uh, couldn't wrap their head around it. And so uh, sometimes you have to get creative and use bones that uh, don't always belong. So I used an adult proximal fibula, um, uh, shaped it utilizing some saws and a burr, and then reconstruct her wrist um, uh, utilizing that uh, adult fibula, uh, pinned everything in place. She uh, has healed it as pain-free and ha has a decent motion to the wrist. Luckily, it's her non-dominant hand and she's um, cancer-free. So um, with that, uh, I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. I did see a couple questions pop up. And uh, I do want to welcome uh, Alyssa. Thanks so much for making time on the talk. Um, and uh, we'll open it up for uh, questions here in kind of the last 15 minutes. Thank you, Alex. And I apologize for being late. I'm in the middle of moving and I was supposed to move tomorrow and was told I only had today. So, you know, I apologize for being late, guys. 
but I hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions and I know you guys had fantastic talks. I'm sorry I missed those two. Yeah, well, um, thanks so much. I, I do have one question here in the chat that um, is kind of directed uh, towards Erica, uh, just in understanding experience applying to ortho as a, uh, as a Canadian and, and understanding that kind of some of the nuances of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm actually typing a prolonged response to that right now because it gets complicated. Um, essentially, the the question is, do I a dual apply to U.S. and Canadian match? And the answer to that, I would say, is if you would take any Canadian spot over any U.S. spot, then I would do it because the Canadian match happens first. And if you match anywhere in Canada, you have to drop out of the U.S. match. Um, and secondly, I was kind of in the same situation where I was a U.S. medical grad, but I was a foreign citizen and I didn't know any, there's not really a stat that applies to me. I'm not a foreign medical grad. I'm not a U.S. Uh, citizen. Um, and all the stats are based on that. Um, there's two types of visas. There's the J-1 and the F-1. If you want to stay in the U.S., you want to target schools that offer the F-1 visa only because the J-1 visa uh, essentially for there's really no way around it. It's going to kick you out of the country for two years after you finish training. Even if you get married, even if you think you're going to get a green card, you can't transition off of J1. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things. But if you're looking to stay in the U.S., I wouldn't necessarily let your Canadian uh, citizenship uh, affect your how you're thinking about your chances. It didn't, it didn't seem to affect uh, my offers. And I really, the only thing I would say is you really want to target schools that have an F1 visa if you're planning to stay and work in the U.S. Now, if you want to go back to Canada, it probably makes sense to apply to a Canadian match because everything after residency just gets so much easier to continue working in the country that you trained in. Um, but yeah, that's... I can type any more detailed answers in the... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like furiously typing a, a small novel to you right now, but uh, that's the long and short of it. Wow. Um, yeah, well, thanks for being uh, active in the question and answer session, but I, I really actually want uh, Dr. Cipriano to, there was a question in the, the group just about understanding um, the balance between being an orthopedic oncologist and an arthroplasty surgeon and uh, maybe how taking a dual pathway um, has helped or enriched your career. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I also wanted to apologize that I wasn't on for the beginning of this. I actually just made it home in time to say goodnight to my daughter, who's still somehow awake. So um, all the all the balances. <laughs> and Alicia, totally understand the moving thing. Life happens. Um, and Erica just getting out of the OR. So um, uh, I'm just really glad we all got to be here in some shape or form. And uh, and Alex, thank you so much for pinch moderating. Um, anyway, so uh, the uh, the question about um, recon and tumor. Um, so I um, my tr my formal training is I, I did a six month adult reconstruction fellowship and a full year of, of orthopedic oncology. I, I did it that way because I wanted the additional six months um, to do some uh, work overseas. So there was, uh, you know, lo lots of thinking outside the box going on there, too. And um, I actually I really enjoy the balance. Um, I think that having a second specialty if you find one that interests you does increase your flexibility in the kind of job that you can take and make you more marketable in a, in a sense if if um you know everyone's whether they need someone to do uh primary arthroplasties as well uh or someone to revise the uh tumor prostheses that are that are failing i can tell you that will make you a very popular partner um, and that's something I do as well. I, I, uh, I'm ha happy to take on revision mega prostheses and kids that have, um, reconstructions done for their, and have survived their osteosarcoma or whatever it is. And then the prosthesis goes on to fail as they become an adulthood because kids use their prosthetics hard, um, and, uh, and so, and I, and I'm really happy to do that because I like doing those things too. For me, that, that is the same sort of, 
uh, creative puzzle that, um, that we describe for primary sarcomas and metastatic disease as well. So um, uh, was there a specific question, um, Alex, a, a related to that or, or how it was how you do the training or? I, I think that answered it actually really nicely. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it, I, I, I actually reached out to Kara when I was a fourth year, uh, resident trying to decide if I wanted to apply to two subspecialties. And uh, in the end, I, I just, uh, ended up doing the oncology fellowship. Uh, but I, ironically, I, I think any ability that you have to either build confidence or a skill set uh, is meaningful. And so, um, I, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think anyone else did dual fellowships on the call. Um, you know, in addition to that question, um, there, there was an ask just about, um, you know, uh, your, your pathway into, um, uh, finding, oh, kind of building that rapport, understanding to be an oncologist as, uh, as training as an orthopedist. So I don't know, maybe uh, Alyssa or Nina, um, how how do you kind of build that rapport and or have those hard conversations with families? Yeah, I think that's probably the, the one thing that I love about orthopedic oncology the most, but also the thing that's the most challenging, right? Um, it's, it's hard to deliver bad news. It's really hard to deliver bad news about someone's child. Um, so, you know, I just try to make sure, again, you take your time, try not to rush, try to sit down, try to connect with the families and ask them what their goals are and make sure that when you're delivering information, you're highlighting and emphasizing what their goals are. Um, stop frequently, ask them, do they have any questions? And I, and the way I like to ask if they have any questions are what questions can I answer? Because sometimes people don't think they're in, they're allowed to ask questions. So just, you know, starting off and making yourself be open and, and seeming as, as though you're receptive to them, I think is always really helpful. And then I practice in a pretty um, unique place. I practice in Detroit um, for right now. And, and so the literacy rates are often really low. So I feel like I've done this bang up awesome job where I've like totally explained all the pathology and how we're going to reconstruct. And I think the patients totally understand and they're like, okay, so like, am I going to have, are you going to cut? Like, are you going to open the skin to take out the tumor? And so I find that having like a lot of visual aids, you know, a lot of pictures. Yes. Um, but also like actual models that they can hold and feel of the different body parts tends to help. Um, and I try to try to incorporate that, you know, pretty early on uh, in the conversation, because that often helps, you know, break down the barriers that we that we have that we face with literacy. Um, and so it's a challenge. It's definitely a challenge for sure. Yeah, you know, I can just add a couple things. Um, I think there's kind of two ways to answer that question. There's like the philosophical way, like how do you connect with patients? And then there's just the actual tangible, practical, pragmatic, like what do you say? <laughs> um, so I think the point the, the points that Alicia made are really um, are very accurate that you have to take your time you, I've learned that like, I can literally go off for 15 minutes without taking a breath. And I mean, we all know that retention drops off after like 90 seconds. So um, I will, I've taught myself now to every couple sentences, just like stop talking. Because if they have a question that they want to ask, they'll then interject it. They're just like waiting for me to take a breath. So I will just literally stop and pause. And if then they don't take that cue um, to ask a question, then I kind of continue with the next like paragraph. <laughs> and um, I encourage you guys to all try that, not only like in your professional lives, but also just like in life. Um, some of us can just like, and um, it's really helpful to the other person if you just give your give them a little pause, which is kind of your own body language way of allowing them to bring up a question that they can't 
keep listening to you if they don't have answered. Um, additionally, just some very practical um, phrases that I use. Um, and I think that even in subspecialties other than oncology, you can use these are, um, I'm gonna treat you like I would want my mom treated or my sister treated or my son treated. Um, that immediately like builds a bond with whoever you're talking to. I'm gonna treat you like I would want my family member treated. Um, I also immediately, as soon as I tell them the diagnosis, I say, you know, I'm really sorry to have to tell you this, but the biopsy does show that this is osteosarcoma. I immediately follow it up with, but this is 100% treatable and possibly curable because you, as compared to just like throwing it to them and then like shutting down, they, their mind immediately starts thinking like, what's next? What's next? Is there a treatment? And so to reassure them that it is a hundred percent treatable and very possibly curable, I use that phrase all the time. And you can see them like have this heightened panic and then the panic comes down. Um, one other thing I say all the time is like, tell me what's important to you because what's important to you is important to me. Um, and it's amazing how different different patients will answer that question, but that is how we think about some of these decisions we make with patients and families is, you know, there isn't one right answer. It's the right answer for that person, which is the wrong answer for the person down the hall, you know? Um, so being able to understand what's important to them and their priorities uh, and reflect that back in your recommendations um, is really important. I like being direct and like telling them that that's what I'm doing. And uh, that immediately builds rapport. They trust you. They like you. They want to talk to you. They want to open up to you. And then it's a, it's a team sport at that point. Yeah. Nina, that's terrific. I would just, I, 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 um, this is, there's so much wisdom in everything that people are sharing. Uh, I, another thing, like you said, this probably you know, you're talking about this as well, just they want to know what the next step is. So whenever I tell someone that they have cancer, I always try to have the next step already lined up. So not, not that you have cancer and now we're going to figure out what to do about it. It's like you have cancer and your appointment with the medical oncologist is tomorrow, um, or I've already talked to them. And so that they, I think the faster people can move into the uh, focusing on the next step, um, I, I think the easier it is mentally for them. Um, in terms of communication, and, and Alex, one of my my questions for you, actually, I know I have a very specific way that um, that I that I broach the topic of something like rotation plasty with patients and specific and especially their their families, um, because it's something that. That operation in particular, I think any of us think is a great solution and very few patients feel feel that way the first time they hear about it. So um, it, do you have a, like Nina was saying, do you have specific words or a specific strategy that you use to talk about these things um, so that the to keep them from checking out before they've actually heard you? Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. I, uh, number one, for me, it's really important to talk to the kids that, uh, as we're going through these discussions. So, um, you know, if a kid is horrified by a rotation plasty, um, and if they're scared of getting amputated, I bring it up that sometimes it's an option, but 90% of the time we can save your, your leg. So you kind of, um, unveil all of the options and I'll, I'll actually modify the talk if I don't think an option is a good one. Um, and so I have a couple of different versions of that. Um, uh, but I, I do think that it takes a couple of meetings. So, you know, the first time you kind of drop the bomb, I'm really concerned your child might have cancer. Um, we're going to do all this stuff to get more information. We're going to talk about what we're going to do. Yeah. To try to get you to cure um, and then we're going to talk about what's going to be the best reconstruction option for your goals. But it's uh, some 
kids will tell you immediately, either they think the rotation plasty is the coolest thing ever, or they're like, no way, you can't do that to my body. And so then I, I usually take it off the table. Um, for adults, like Nina said, pausing, I actually now have these um, sheets that I write as I talk. And it forces me to leave the patients with some notes so they haven't forgotten everything that I said and those next steps that you discussed. So I, I think finding a system that works for you um, and building that rapport. Sometimes if you're the person that tells someone they have cancer, they just can't get over you and they have to find someone else. And, and that's okay too. You can have your feelings hurt a little bit, but um, you know, sometimes they need someone else. That's, that's great. I've act, I mean, I've tried with, with respect to the rotation plasty, I try to lay out the options like you do, but I'll work backwards. So I'll start with describing each one in terms of functional, compli uh, functional expected function and risk of complications without telling them what the surgeries actually are. And so I have my columns. And then as it turns out, rotation plasty is probably the highest function and the lowest risk of compl complications. So it at least gets them to listen to it before saying, I don't even want to think about it when they realize that they can go back to doing whatever they want and stay out of the hospital. So anyway, but we all, oh, I may have it. to try that. I've only convinced <laughs> one. I've had a, I've had a couple actually, actually it's like you said, so this one little girl, I don't know, she's six or eight came in and she told me she wanted the rotation plastic. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, how are we doing on time? Are we finishing at nine 15? I think we um we have some questions that are are compelling that we didn't really get to answer. Oh, about let's do them. How um and, and I don't know if this is going to auto shut us off, but um maybe the the few questions I think would be meaningful. How did you decide to pursue a career in orthopedic oncology? And um then um as a a first year medical student that's interested in orthopedic oncology, how do you kind of get involved and find mentors and things like that? Who wants well, to take? I was yeah. going to say, I, I can start us Go off. Go for it. So as a medical student, I think there's lots of um, mentors and groups like um, RJOS has their, I, I don't know what the official title is, but they have little chapters of RJOS at each, at a lot of different medical schools around the country. Um, so, you know, and like, thankfully, a lot of women in orthopedics happen to be orthopedic oncologists, but there are also a lot of women who do trauma and who do, you know, arthroplasty, who do sports. So you'll get like a wide variety and access to a lot of mentors if you just join one of those groups. So I think that's probably the easiest and the first place to start. Um, but I think most of us are open. There's a Facebook group. There's like lots of interaction on social media. And a lot of us are just open to you just sending messages and, and, you know, trying to connect. I will be honest. My least favorite question is what is your journey? So don't ask that if you email me, but you can ask any other creative question that you want, like, you know, anything else other than what is your journey? So, um, yeah, I would just say, reach out, reach out, connect, you know, and be around when we have meetings. So the Ruth Jackson meeting at the Academy was like well attended this year, probably you know, four to 500 people there. And those are just a room full of women who want to mentor, who want to engage with you. So going to those events are probably the best and easiest way to get the highest number of mentors. Hopefully that took a couple of those questions out. <laughs> yeah, that was great. And, and really as a first year medical student, I think um, you have to pick your overall subspecialty first, right? So you probably don't want to torture, if you hate orthopedic surgery, you probably don't want to torture yourself through five years of residency just to become an orthopedic oncologist. There are other ways to care for sarcoma patients. So I, I think uh, at an early stage in your career, really learn as much as you can and be open to different subspecialties. Hopefully you love ortho in the process. That's why you're here. Um, and, and then build those mentorships kind of organically in your own institution and um, always being able to kind of have that interest of caring for cancer patients, I think is really meaningful and, uh, and can help guide your career. I love the fact about being open. You may not, you may get to sarcoma through medical oncology or surgical oncology. So 
every rotation you go on, every time you interact with somebody, take time to ask them, get to know them, because you never know how you're going to get to take care of these types of patients. And you may get on your surgery rotation and hate it, but you, mu you might love your internal medicine rotation. So stay open. That's great advice, Alex. Couldn't agree more. And then are we going to quickly answer, how did we choose? I'll kick it to Yeah, yeah maybe everyone maybe Erica. Give, give like a 30 second. I, I, I think uh, if we try to wrap up in the next two minutes, maybe Nina, how did you decide sure. to become orthopedic yeah, oncologist? Yeah, so the two things that really drew me to orthopedic oncology were the variety um, and the intellectual exercise. Um, so just to go a little bit deeper on both of those. Um, orthopedic oncology was the only subspecialty that allows me to operate all over the body. I do bone and soft tissue work. I take care of adults and kids. I do resections and reconstructions. I use uh, fixation devices like plates and nails. I use arthroplasty components. Just the variety uh, kept me from ever getting, keeps me from ever getting bored. So that was a huge draw. The second draw was the intellectual kind of like the challenge of, of tumor, which I thought was really unique um, over any other subspecialty. And a lot of the other subspecialties, the diagnosis was not in question. You know, like if you throw an x-ray of a smashed pelvis up, everyone agrees that that pelvis is broken. Now you can debate for hours and hours how to treat it, but half of the battle is like a very easily won. And then you just focus on the second half. But in tumor, the diagnosis is at least half of the battle. Um, and you really have to logically put all the pieces together to establish the diagnosis. And then you start talking about treatment. So I really thought that it was a very rich subspecialty that um, was very intellectually challenging. And um, that those are the two things that drew me. I'll, I'll go after Nina because I think a lot of it is very similar for me. For me, it's the creativity of the field. And that's a lot what Nina's talking about, the, the variety of the procedures coupled with the um, individualized treatment for each patient. Um, I, I think that's what's really most compelling to me. Plus, you're taking care of patients who often are at a really tough point and um, and it, it makes us a little bit different from most people who go into orthopedic surgery because we want to take care of patients who get better. And you see this as, you know, anyone who reads applications for residency will see that come up over and over. But I actually I like taking care of patients who also might not do better. And I think those people deserve good doctors, too. And, and that's a lot of what um, of what we see as our role. Erica? Oh, I think I think that you both have spoken to a lot of things that drew me. Um, in terms of making the decision, it was actually a couple of Dr. Cipriano's patients. Uh, an intern year, I still remember her name, and she walked in with a giant mass in her leg. And I walked out of the room, and I was like, this is one of two things, and it's not good. And you did a, a double compress on her. And I remember looking her up in like right before I left and she was doing fine. And it was just like when I thought back on it, it's really like those oncology patients that I connected with in residency. Um, they were the ones I couldn't tell you whose knee I replaced. I couldn't tell you whose ACL I did, but I really remember all the oncology patients. And that was really what sold it for me in terms of choosing this as a fellowship. You know, I could have done joints. I could have done trauma, but I would have missed the oncology part of it. Um, and in terms of what I enjoy about it, it's, it, you really do have to find joy in, in the things like Dr. Superman was talking about and, in, in helping people live the best life for as long as they got. Right. Um, and that's not something that everybody wants to do as an orthopedic surgeon. Um, some people don't want to connect with their patients. Some people don't want to have a 10 year relationship with their patients, but, um, but I really wanted all of those things. Uh, I just, I, I love so much about the specialty. It's, it's just, it's so perfect for me. Um, and I'm finding that every day. So. Thanks so much, Erica. Uh, Alyssa, you want to tell us your story? Sure. Not my journey, but my story. Sure. <laughs> just kidding. 
Um, I would say my favorite part about it is the advocacy. Um, I think I got into orthopedic oncology because of being able to advocate for patients. Um, and I found that that's probably what keeps me there too. Sometimes you're you're winding back to see where someone's been told they had cancer and they actually don't. Um, I, that's like probably my favorite part of the day where I'm like, this is totally a lipoma. We'll take this out, you'll be totally fine. That's you know one of the best things about my day. Um, but then sometimes fighting to get them the the things they need, like the procedures they need, the MRIs they need. I just kind of actually kind of enjoy that little squabble. Um, so it's just I just love everything about the advocacy that we get to be uh, that we get to do on behalf of our patients. Um, and then, you know, watching them go to prom, watching them get married, watching them have kids. Um, you know, so those are just those are just moments that you just don't get in other specialties. So. I really like that. That's that's amazing. Alex, did you go already? You know, I kind of incorporated into my talk, but I, sure. ironically, I um I had like kind of an aha moment in residency where I loved every subspecialty. Um and uh and then I won the pathology competition. Um <laughs> So my last bit of advice as you guys are working your way through picking uh, a subspecialty or even just picking a residency program or field, um, pick something that you are going to feel good at because you don't want to just um, pick something because you feel like you have to do it or you had, um, you know, your best friend in second grade had an osteosarcoma and you felt like that became your life calling. I mean, that's a really cool story, but you should pick something that you feel good at. And um, and so one of the steps in me uh, picking to become a tumor surgeon was that I, I felt like I would be good at it. So. Great. Well, you guys were amazing. I'm, I'm so thrilled to have um, such a fabulous bunch of friends in my field. <laughs> Um, and the, the talks were fantastic and, and the conversation as well. So thank you all for that. Thank you for the engaged, um, audience and the, the great questions that you asked. And again, Alex, thank you for moderating. Um, anything else before we sign off? Thank you for organizing. This is a great session. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. Great group to be a part of. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Take care. <laughs>